chapter here at Iowa State University. We would like to welcome all of you to our lecture tonight, which is about Islam, the misunderstood religion, by Brother Dr. Abdul Azim al Siddiq. Dr. Abdul Azim al Siddiq, from 1997 to present, he is the director of the African American Society for Humanitarian Aid and Development at Chicago, Illinois. 1997 to present, the vice president of the Islamic Call Organization, ICO, Chicago, Illinois. 1996 to 1997, he is the director of Pleasant View Islamic School in Memphis, Tennessee. 1995 to 1996, the founder and director of the Foundation of Islamic Education in Villanova, Pennsylvania. 1990 to 1995, he is the founder and director of the Al-Aqsa Islamic Center and School at Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. 1986 to 1987, he is the vice president for public relations, International Student Association, Temple University, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. 1984 to 1995, President of the Muslim Student Association, University of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. 1983 to 1984, Teaching Assistant, Department of Commercial Law, University of Khartoum, Sudan. 1982 to 1983, Teaching Assistant, Department of Islamic Studies, University of Khartoum, Sudan. Dr. Abdul Azim has a PhD in Islamic Studies from Temple University, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, 1993. He, is a he has a master's degree of art in religion from Temple University, 1989, and he has a master from Penn Law School in 1985. Dr. Abdul Azim, he is a pleasant and he has a sense of humor. And he didn't say that in his CV. Please put your hands together to welcome Dr. Abdul Azim. <laughs> Inshallah, we'll have the lecture for 20 minutes and then we'll open it for the discussion. He believes that the discussion will enrich the lecture rather than lecturing for a long time. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah Nabiina wa Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa ala my dear respected uh, uh, brothers and friends, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. That means peace be with you. Uh, tonight we are supposed to speak about Islam, the misunderstood religion. And by misunderstood religion, I mean not misunderstood only by the non-Muslims, but I mean the Muslims themselves. So the message of Islam, in my opinion, has long been forgotten in its true sense. And starting by defining Islam itself, it simply means peace or total submission to the will of God. How Islam uh, came to be understood as religion of uh, terrorism, that is something I myself I do not know. And if you can help us redefine Islam tonight, that would be the best service to humanity. So this is not just a matter of entertainment, and then we'll end up saying that we had attended a good lecture. This is a challenge and responsibility that rests heavily on the shoulders of each and every one of us, Muslims first and non-Muslims as well. So 
being one of the most celebrated religions on earth today, Islam is the religion of not less than one billion Muslims, human beings. They have the same ambitions as you do, and they have the same dreams, just like anybody on earth. The fact that Islam is defined in terms of Allah as God of the Arabs, and Muhammad as the prophet of the Arabs, and the Quran as the Arabic book of the Arabs, is a basic misunderstanding. And because of that, there are many confusions, many misunderstandings, misinterpretations that came to exist in our minds. And unless we will have the liberty and freedom to cast away all these illusions, we would never reach to the bottom of the truth. The truth and the plain truth is that Islam is the religion of everyone. And if there is anyone who will come tonight to think that he owns or monopolizes Islam, he is either does not know what to say or what he is saying is not true. Because in chapter one of the Quran, the Quran is of 114 chapters. The most important of them all is chapter one. No Muslim will be praying if he would not recite that chapter. It is just of seven verses. The first verse in the Quran reads, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. That means praise be to Allah, the one God, the supreme God, and the Lord of the universe, of everyone. So defining Allah or simply trying to uh, see or to perceive Allah as the God of the Arabs is one of the basic misunderstandings, as I have said. Allah is an Arabic word for the Supreme God, who is mine and yours as well, because there is just one God. And the only difference is in the way that how we approach him in heaven. Second, when we say Muhammad, and we say it this way, for us, the Arabs, we say Muhammad, peace be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's the prophet of Islam sent for humanity, for each and every individual, not for me, you, or us, or no, for every one of us, without any exception. And unless we will not, we will, we will not see this in the way that it is, we will be doing ourselves great injustice. Because Muhammad himself has never claimed that he is only for the Arabs. The message is to simply complete and finish the unfinished part of the message that had started by each and every prophet and messenger who came before him. So the idea of isolating Muhammad from the others in itself is we are not simply doing ourselves great justice. Jihad, which is always taken as a holy war in order to spread Islam through the soul, is misunderstood. Jihad is simply to do one's best for the best of humanity. And unless we will understand this, we would never move together tonight in one boat. The assumption is we are students of knowledge. We are here to know, to understand, to broaden our horizon, and to see through the eye of the mind, not the eye, not the naked eye, which we call in Arabic al-basira. And unless you will have that, you would never see truth. Never see it. So tonight, when we hear the word jihad, we simply mean to struggle for the perfection, for the betterment, for spreading the truth. And you will be even making jihad, the first thing is against yourself, against your greed, against your selfishness, against your shortcomings, your failures, and against anything that will simply cause you to be damned and doomed on the day of judgment. The judgment is left only to Allah, the Supreme God. And that is between you and him. And Islam is defined in a way that there is no one whatsoever, of whatever capacity and authority, who has the right to become between you or to come between you and Allah. So when it comes to ibadah, the ritualistic relationship between God the Creator 
and we the created, there is no one who can come in between. And that is the whole theory of salvation in Islam. No one can come between you and Allah. No one can pray for you or die for you. You will only be saved through your own good deeds, which will be kept in a record. From the time you are of age to the time of your death, as long as you are of sound mind, you are responsible for your actions, and that is the basic foundation for individual responsibility in Islam. So the whole idea of someone dying for me or for you does not make any sense to the Muslims. And this is one of the basic things that we have to understand tonight. Between you, uh, Imam al-Junaid, one of the early scholars of Islam, when he was asked about at-tawheed, well, ikhlas, fil ibadah, he said, an takuna ma'al khaliq bila khalq, wa an takuna ma'al khalq bila nafs. When it comes to this vertical relationship between God, the creator, and we, the created, there should be no one who will, who will come in between us. The road is always open for you to see through and to move on in order to reach. Where, you, where is your destiny? That is only Allah, the Supreme God, knows. And when it comes to man-to-man -man relationship, or what we call al-mu'amala, the transactions, the daily interactions, the contact between you and others, let yourself not be in focus. That is selfishness. And that is the beginning of the damnation. We are always mixing our understanding of Islam or our Islamic practices with our traditions, with cultures, with the customs and habits. If one wants to quote from Islam rather than going to the sources, to the Quran or the Sunnah, he will go and to see the practices and the traditions which are existing right now in any of the countries. There is no country on earth that can claim today that it applies or follows Islam in its totality as preached by Muhammad the Prophet. No country on earth today Arab or non-Arab can claim fully and justify their claim by trying to simply project an idea in our minds that this is Islam as has been taught by Muhammad the Prophet and as practiced by his companions. That is an ideal which we the Muslims have lost long time ago. And that came because of the fact that we are supposed to be one united ummah under one God. And since we have lost that unity, this unity became a norm in Islam. And from that on, we were scattered like the, the lost sheep, as the Hadith states. And since then, we have lost Islam as a norm, as an ideal. And we have just come back in order to live like the pre-Islamic nations in many of our practices. So if you want to talk about women in Islam, which is always a hot issue, for scholars to do some research on, women in Islam cannot be simply studied because of a practice or a tradition or any uh, uh, social behavior that could be seen or felt by a journalist, by a reporter, or by any media man who will visit a certain country coming to say that this is Islam. No. The only way that you can understand Islam is by reading about Islam. And you understand Islam in the way that has been preached by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because he is the only one who has given authority and power to interpret the Quran and that will be the final interpretation. And he is the only one who through his own conduct and behavior has set the example to be followed. So now Islam is redefined as God, as the Lord of everyone including me and you, without an exception. Those who believe in this, they are Muslims. And those who do not believe in that, they are the non-Muslims. And between us, there is nothing other than calling you to the way of Allah in the best way that we could, with respect and full recognition to our differences. And there is no one who can simply coerce or force anyone to change his religion. That is one. The second thing is, 
Muhammad throughout his 23 years of prophethood has never forced anyone to become a Muslim because he has no right to do that. And that is from the Quran. فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّمَا أَنْتَ مُذَكِّرْ لَسْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ بِمُصَيْطِرْ إِلَّا مَنْ تَوَلَّى وَكَفَرْ Just remind them and call them kindly to the cause of Allah. Show them the best way that can bring them together in peace. And you have no right or authority to claim other than you yourself is just a reminder. Reminder of a forgotten truth. That is God is one and we have to follow and live up to his word. Okay. Many of the issues that are really hot issues today in the minds of the followers of Islam, they are hot simply because they are existing from the pre-Islamic era, from the pre-Islamic time. And let me just give you an example. Here in this MSA chapter, and I understood that this function was simply, uh, it is the MSA that called for it. Okay, this will take me back to 1984, 1985, when we are, uh, uh, students at Temple and at Penn, calling others to tell them about Islam. And there is always an argument. What Islam we want to preach? Is it that which was practiced in Saudi Arabia, in Egypt, in Africa, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, or in Turkey? Is it the halal meat that's always being the issue? What to eat and what not? Women should cover their head and faces or not, down to their feet, and including their hands. The issue of segregation has always been a hot issue when we were on campus. I do not know the exact situation now. But let me tell you something. That there is no, you wouldn't find any two Muslims that will differ on the basic fundamentals of Islam. And the basic fundamentals of Islam, as were given by the Prophet, are five. First, the creed to say there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his servant and messenger. That is the kalima without which you cannot become a Muslim. And this is why Islam is the most easy religion on earth. Just by saying this word apparently and to utter it through your tongue or using your tongue to say la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, you have become a Muslim. Whatever thing that is in your heart that is between you and him, no one has any right to judge over you simply because whether you said it for a purpose or because there is some certain interest that you are going to fulfill or to follow. That is Islam, just by saying la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. This is what we call in Islam or what we understand as لَيْسَ الْإِيمَانُ بِالتَّمَنِّ وَلَا بِالتَّحَلِّ وَلَكِنْ مَا وَقَرَ فِي الْقَلْبِ وَصَدَّقَهُ الْعَمَلِ Islam is not just a lip surface. It is not just a wish. It is something that could be said by a tongue, penetrate the heart, and be implemented in good actions. And from the time you would say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, that is a claim, will be proved and proven only through good actions, starting by the five daily prayers, Salawat al Khams, Ada al Zakat, to give a certain portion of your money, of your wealth, which is 2.5% to the poor as a community service. And we would come to know that as far as the theoretical part of Islam is concerned, Muslims are really doing good. But when it comes to the practical responsibility in the society that will move us collectively, we have failed to do that. And from there, or from the time of our failures on, whatever thing that has been seen as Islam is just part of the truth, but not the whole truth. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in, the, in, in, in his sunnah, in his hadith, لَنْ يَقُومَ بِهَذَا الدِّينِ إِلَّا مَنْ أَحَاطَهُ بِكُلِّ جَوَانِبِهِ Islam would never come to be life walking on earth until and unless it will be seen in its totality. And the totality of Islam has long been forgotten, long been um, um, overlooked and disappeared because of the failure of the Muslims themselves. Okay, from here then, the fasting of the month of Ramadan, and of course I assume that each and everyone on campus has felt that 
the month of Ramadan is, is one of the most celebrated months through the calend Islamic calendar by the Muslims. And we know that because Muslims fast through the day and stand in their night prayers through the night, and by the end of that, they will celebrate the end of the month of Ramadan through a feast which they call Eid al-Fitr. So there is no problem here. Muslims, they are fasting in the same way that Muhammad did 1400 years ago. But the challenge is, what did we get out of the spirit of the fasting? Have we followed it up throughout the years? Have we successfully transferred it and transformed it in a way that it will bring peace to the humanity? Have we always followed it up in action so that it could be seen and testify to the truth that Islam is a religion of peace? Traditions are mistaken for laws and rules that are existing in any given society. What we call al-'adah is completely different from al-'ibadah, as I said. And al-'araf, what taqalid, traditions, customs, must be simply distinguished from what we call al-fiqh wa al-fatwa. Of course, there is no doubt for those who have some knowledge about Islam that we may differ in opinion on few issues, on minor issues, but that difference should not go to the roots of Islam or what we will call usul al-Islam. In that, you wouldn't find any trouble. As far as the West is concerned, I'm going to, how much time do I have, five minutes? Okay, I have five minutes. Okay, the media in the West is doing us great favor by bringing Islam life into light. But are they fair enough to bring Islam in a way that Muslims want it to be shown and seen? Of course not. The Western media has been very selective, and by this selectivity, they distorted the message of Islam in its totality. Islam is seen in the actions or the political actions taken by either Muammar Gaddafi of Libya or Saddam Hussein of Iraq. And that is the only way that we can see Islam live on the American TV. And this in itself is great injustice to a message to which more than one billion people are following on earth today. Second, Islam is not the religion of the Arabs as I said, because not every and each Arab is a Muslim. This is one. There are Arabs, there are Christian Arabs. And even the Arabs themselves, all of the Arabs, they are just a minority in the Muslim population. And we have to understand that. From where the Arabs are seen as being very significant and very important, it is simply because the Quran is in Arabic and Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, was an Arab. And other than these two things, there is nothing that can add prestige or any status to the Arabs that can claim in Islam. The Arabs are Muslims so long as they will follow Islam. But other than this, they are just like any human beings on earth. This is a fact that we have to understand, and it should always be in our minds. Finally, I have a question for each and every one of you, and let me just be honest. We are here to accept your questions, your comments, and I have no problem in answering any questions so far as I know the answer. But I just want you to understand, or I want to ask you this question. What is the first thing that comes to your mind, you as non-Muslims, when you hear about Islam? I know well that you will think about the Arabs, the oil, the terrorists, and the certain Arab leaders, whom we call as, see as fundamentalists, or terrorists, or as acting against the interest of the West. So with this, I will leave you, hoping that I will entertain your questions and comments, and this will bring my presentation to an end. Thank you very much.
Now we open the floor for questions. Yes. Uh, could you uh, explain what the position is of, all, of Islam with respect to atheism and atheists? Everyone is free to accept Islam or not. And atheism is not an, an exception at all, because there were many Arab atheists by the time of the Prophet himself. The only difference is, when atheism becomes a threat to Islam itself, just like it did by the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if you have any idea about the history of Islam. From the time the Prophet settled in al Madina, after he has completed 13 years of his prophethood in Mecca, he was first surrounded by the Meccans in Uhud. They marched to destroy his state in Al-Madina. Then they came in Al-Ahzab, or the Battle of the Trench, in order to destroy him. And finally, when he gained power, he moved in order to free Mecca as the birthplace of Islam. So, in honesty, I don't see any reason that anyone as individual will stand up today in order to force anyone to become a Muslim in the way that it has been portrayed in the Western media today. As Islam is uh, a religion of coercion or anything like that. Islam is Islam. The only accepted religion to Allah, the supreme God in heaven. Any other religion would not count. When the Muslims have the authority to simply crush others because they are non-Muslims, no. Do we accept any truth that will come out of Islam with the Muslims? No, because I just want to make it very plain and very clear now. Because Allah says in the Quran, Inna din عند الله Islam, The accepted religion to Allah is Islam and only Islam. Truth is in Islam and only in Islam. Any other thing is falsehood. Even if it was truth by then, it had been abrogated. Whether we have the right to do anything else than call, calling people to the way of Islam in the best, nice way, we don't. That is simply it. Unless you have a follow-up question. If you can just come closer. the question after me. Okay. You say Islam is firm and society. How is that? Islam is what? Uh, society. Islam is? Society. Society. Mm. How is that? Islam is society? Yeah. Yes, we as Muslims, we are supposed to accept Islam as individuals and then to leave it in our families, to spread it to our neighborhoods, and from there it will spread in order to cover the whole earth. And this is from reading of Islamic history. It is started by Muhammad the Prophet, by his handful, few companions. And then it is spread in Al-Madinah. And from there it went out in order to cover the whole world by then. So Islam without society cannot exist. A society of Muslims and that is Ummah. Because by definition, as Allah says in the Quran, وَإِنَّ هَذِهِ أُمَّتُكُمْ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا وَأَنَا رَبُّكُمْ فَاعْبُدُونَ وفي uh, الآية الأخرى وَأَنَا رَبُّكُمْ فَاتَّقُونَ That means it is one united community under one God. And this is the whole notion of Ummah which came late in al Madina. So without a society of believers, Islam would not exist. And without Islam, there is no society. So, uh, Islam, by definition, is a religion that will be accepted by Muslims who will accept Allah as their Lord and Creator, Muhammad as their Prophet, and the Quran as their last testament. That is simply it. Other questions? Yes. We will, we will bring the person to the mic. I, I think this is, this, is, this is easy and better. So whoever wants to ask a question, please feel free to come here to the mic. Yes. I happen to disagree there is a society of pagan, a society of, uh, of uh, atheists, a society of Muslims. 
So to, to say society is Islam, Islam is society, that is not necessarily true. Islam is a so Yeah, and, and I would like you to repeat the five pillars of Islam again. I don't think you completed. Okay. There are five. The creed, that is the word, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, the Allah is one and Muhammad is his messenger. Then, as salah, the five daily prayers. As zakah is the 2.5% of our wealth to the poor and the needy. And the fasting of the month of Ramadan. And finally, going to Mecca to do Hajj, which is pilgrimage. These are the five pillars of Islam. And whatever you have said, my friend, is your opinion. There are uh, different societies, uh, Muslims and non-Muslims, and from the constitution of al Madina, which was drawn by uh, Muhammad himself and signed by himself, uh, there was a Muslim community and a non-Muslim community. And uh, you can just go back and read uh, the Islamic political history. So Muhammad never forced the Jews to become Muslims. And he had never forced anyone to become a Muslim. So he stayed there, but there are the constitution of Medina completely and, uh, and clearly stated that the Muslims are a society and the non-Muslims were a society in themselves. Yes. Did you say um, that Islam was the only truth? For me, otherwise I wouldn't be a Muslim. If there is any Muslim who wouldn't accept that Islam is the only truth, there is no need for us to stay in Islam. Because we are supposed to go somewhere else and, and, and seek truth. If I am not 100% sure that Islam is the plain truth and the only truth, I would have still been uh, uh, chasing and seeking days and nights. I would never rest. Because it is not a question or it, this is not just an entertainment, it's not a hobby. This is something that concerns my salvation. It is more important than anything on earth. So if I am not quite convinced that Islam is the only truth, I would have spent my days and nights looking for the truth. But, but for me at least, and I know it, it, it is right for each and every Muslim here that Islam is the only truth. Just like your religion is the ultimate truth for you, otherwise you would ne you have never stayed there. So for those who uh, 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 among Muslims have any doubts in their minds that Islam is not the only truth, they are not Muslims. Is there any Muslim who, who has any doubt that Islam is not the ultimate truth? Is there anyone? I have never met any so far. Yes. recognized as either prophets or Rasulullah, and therefore there is a sense that revelation came to people before the receipt of the Quran, and Islam is, it embraces, at least recognizes that they had the truth, that other people introduced the innovation. So I think it, you're creating a sense that there is no acceptance of a prior revelation. I think that's a very important this is, this is very important. In each and every prophet who came before Muhammad, this is why I quoted the question is, would Islam, is, um, Islam has been preached and taught by each and every prophet who came before Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, in the way that we understand Islam today. That is, that is, this is very important. However, the fact that Islam as we understand it today, or as we live it today, has simply abrogated each and everything that came before. Yes, that is true. Jesus was the prophet of his time. And for me, Jesus was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. So the whole idea of a world church in the way that we see it today, for me, does not in any way comply with the teachings of Jesus Christ, who was sent with a very specific message to the Jews of his time in Jerusalem. Those who went astray who want to bring them back. This is one. The second thing is, if it is Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Aaron, or any one of those prophets who came before Muhammad, their messages were completed and done 
by the time they left. There is no religion now for us, the Muslims, that really exists other than Islam. If there is anything that has been embodied in the Quran from these teachings that came before Islam, we will just take it because that is part of our religion. And we would never be Muslims if we would not have the same respect that we have for Muhammad, for each and every prophet that we may know or we may not. This is why we say and we read in the Quran, لا نفرق بين أحد من رسوله. We never set any demarcation, any frontier, any line between the messages that came before Muhammad and the messengers and prophets that came before him. So we believe in Moses just like we believe in Muhammad. And we believe in the Torah and, the, and, and, and in the Injil, Gospel, in the same way that we believe in the Quran. The problem is, where is the real Torah and where is the real Gospel? That is the question. That is the challenge now. And this is a question for each and every Christian today. Show me whatever has been brought by Jesus himself, and I will take it. More questions? Muhammad? Okay. Yes? The question is, uh, do uh, Arab consider the nation of Islam to be Muslims too? Uh, as I said, a Muslim by definition is the one who believes in Allah and Muhammad the Prophet. He believes the Quran as the last word of God revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, establishes the five daily prayers, fast the months of Ramadan, and uh, believes in going to Hajj whenever he can. I don't want to be simply talking about a specific sect or group of persons. But whoever will believe in that and he is ready to do it to the best he could is a Muslim, whether he was recognized by the Arabs or not. Because no one has any right to recognize or simply to deny the right of being a Muslim for anyone else. So it wouldn't help them if they are not. If the nations of Islam is not really a, a Muslim group, it would not do them any good to be recognized by the Arabs. And if they are not true Muslims, it wouldn't do them also any good if they are not. So my question is, my comment is, my answer is, let them be Muslims and they would never be hurt if they were denied by the Arabs. If they are not, it would never do them any good if they will be so recognized. Because what really matters is the acceptance by God. Does he accept us? That's what really matters for me. So I knew from my studies that there are some people who have slight reservations about some things that the nation of Islam may say or some other practices that they may do. But whether they are Muslims or not, that is not left to anyone. No one has any right to do that. Even if we notice that they are not on the right way, we have the duty to call them back to the right way of Islam and to push them in order to practice Islam as it is. Okay. Yes? Excuse me? Did I say that? I'm trying my best using my best uh, advocating abilities in order to drag myself away from, uh, from this. But still, I see you as uh, being very very uh, using every tactic in order to pull me in. If you want a blunt, dark answer, I will say yes. I said yes in order to, to, to find my way and outlet of the question. So I said yes. In a way, this is, this is a paradoxical answer. So it, 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 it bears two meanings. It could be yes, Farrakhan is a Muslim, and I don't have any right to say otherwise. Or I would say, yes, I have some reservations about their teachings. So you take it in any way you like. But you were very clear in saying that there is no, nothing except Islam is accepted. So you have to be clear on this point. Which one? one Which point? Who is arguing about now? 
He is arguing about two points. So if you can just tell me which one. Well, he raised two points. You heard the question. Okay. I think I get the answer. Okay. Uh, the problem is, let me just tell you something. When, when, when we assume the rights and the powers and the authority to judge over others, here is some risk, and I don't want to run into it. I don't want to take it. I don't think I have the right to judge over others. That is basically it. But who is a Muslim and who is not a Muslim is the one who follows Islam as was given to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet. And we have some failures and shortcomings, and we would never reach so long as we have these things in our hearts. And I don't have any right to dig deep in order to see what in, is in their hearts. But from their teaching, there are some observations and, uh, made by many Muslim scholars that unless our brothers, who are the followers of the nation of Islam or members of the nation of Islam will change or will do something about it, they would not be accepted as part of the, what we call Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. That is simply it. I hope I have given at least somewhat acceptable answer to you. Yes. Yeah. Would you accept my answer? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, let me answer his question. Excuse me, I didn't get the, the question. How Muslim view God? Yes, and what is their mm -hmm. God is sup the supreme. Can we hear the question again? What, uh, how do we Muslims uh, perceive and see God? God is God. There is a scholar who said, but let me explain it once more. Law is the law. So let me explain it once more. Allah is Allah, the one in heaven who is the supreme being who created us and uh, who revealed the books from the time of Noah down to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and uh, who created us and who has the authority and the power to either cause us to salvation or damnation and we will be saved only through his blessings, his grace and to a certain degree through our good actions. There is no one unto him. He has no similar, the transcendent, the sublime. And if I want to say the 99 attributes of God, this will take at least one hour from this moment. So in brief, whatever things that may come to your mind, Allah is completely different to be comprehended by our very, very limited comprehension. So our intellect is so restricted to comprehend the real nature of God. Whatever words that we are going to say tonight, whatever thing that we may intend to, see, to, to say in order to express our belief in God, it is a state of mind that will be lived only by a believer and can hardly say or state in words when it comes to God. Okay. Oh, you can take the mic, please. Thank you. Uh, my, my question is when um, Jesus Christ came in, he proved to his, um, his friends that he was a prophet of God by performing some pretty interesting miracles. Um, Muhammad, he went, from what I know, he went into the cave and then he came out. How did he prove to his friends or to his people that he was a prophet of God as well? Or did he do anything not spectacular, but how did, they, how did he be, was able to prove to these people that he was a prophet of God? Just through the Quran. Nothing, nothing other than the Quran. I, I mean, the Quran's what he, he wrote and everything, or his prophet. His you said he came from the cave. Yes. When he came from the cave, he came reciting the first verses that were revealed to him in chapter 96 of the Quran. He didn't claim any other thing. Any other thing that happened to him, it was so secondary, so ancillary to the true and original miracle, and that is the book, and that is the Quran, which is the only existing book on earth today. 
Ms. Come to the mic, please. place Jesus Christ peace be upon him did not perform any miracles by himself according to Bible according to Bible Jesus Christ performed the miracles by the powers he was given by the supreme being according to what Jesus has said in the Bible itself is I do not have the powers to do anything except for my father, who has empowered me to do that. So taking this as the example, you can go to the previous prophets. Moses was given the powers. Noah was given the powers. David was given the powers. All the prophets are the messengers of God, messengers of the same Allah, uh, the Supreme, who is the God of all the, whom all the mankind. He gave certain powers to each and every messenger so that it can facilitate them to spread the word of God or the Supreme Being. Similarly, Prophet Muhammad also showed the miracles in the form of the book or these things. So we should not get confused with the idea that Jesus Christ performed the miracles, which Bible completely, uh, it does not support the idea that Jesus Christ performed the miracles. <coughs> I, finish? Okay. Yeah. One more comment to um, well, one more brother. Here, I want to just add a few lines to the comments of this brother. People should not get into confusion that Islam has came from 1400 years ago. So we are the most accepted religion. And before that, there was the people are not accepted. Islam leaves it wide open. Islam leaves it wide open. Allah leaves it wide open that Whoever, there is only one condition for the whole of human being. The whole, the Islam started with Adam and is still going on. It is the same message which the idea was to complete this message by sending different teachers, messengers, and the prophets. Thousands came and Prophet Muhammad came and ended it. Messenger, to uh, believe in only one supreme, the creator of the world, to make yourself disciplined and responsible, the day of the day, whatever we do has to be responsible. And these two things, and some of the other things, the discipline like the fasting, praying, and performing other things, which were forgotten by previous prophets and okay. Islam perfected it by like introducing strict love. Like Questions? Yes. Uh, can you take the mic? I think I can. Still, people will say we didn't hear the question. I'd like to take you back to the question about the women issue. Hmm. As Muslims here in the U.S., we always get questions about, you mentioned the issue of segregation, uh, polygamy, uh, uh, rights in terms of what Islam gave women. And uh, when we talk about the the teachings of the Prophet and the Quran, there are certain things that are not practiced, but what people ask about is what we practice as Muslims. So I was wondering if you can expand on that a little bit. Yes, I said the question of uh, tradition and, and practice, and it could not be just solved overnight by uh, a statement uh, made in this uh, state, but still we have to do our part. Uh, from my own um, uh, studying of the seer of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I have never come across any incident, any event in the seerah that uh, women or early Muslim uh, women have never been uh, an equal counterpart to the men in any contribution, including wars. So this will show beyond any reasonable doubt that uh, uh, the early Muslim women have effectively contributed into the building of the early Muslim community. And, and if that happened 1,400 years ago, I don't think there is anyone on earth today who has any right to say, let women just be confined to their apartments and not take any role in public life. What about the issue of polygamy? What about it? In terms of what the religion, what the Quran 
monitors and what people practice. What is your opinion on that? I do not know about what the people practice. If they well, practice, the if the Quran says there are certain conditions to get a second wife and a third wife and a fourth wife, but we know the practice and the whether it's in the Middle Eastern countries, whether it's uh, yes, uh, Western countries. Yes, uh, uh, in my opinion, Muslims are good when it comes to the undo part of the duties, because the Quran is do and undo. Imma wajibun yu'ta aw manhiun anhu yuntaha anhu. So when it comes to the undo, Muslims will think that they are good as long as they wouldn't do anything that they are not supposed to do. But they are failure when it comes to the do part. And from here, we can just give many examples, like this one. Polygamy itself has become an issue when the European uh, colonizers came to the Muslim world. And because of the teaching of the church, not the biblical teaching, you know that Solomon uh, had many wives, you know that, and David, and the only one who did not get married from the biblical uh, uh, prophets are just two, John and uh, Jesus. Is there anyone else? Or was there anyone who was just confined to one, uh, to one wife? How many, how many wives did uh, David have? For those who read the Bible, how many? How many uh, wives did uh, Solomon have, wives and concubines? More than 300. Was that right? So Islam reduced and limited the number to four for those who were able to do it. So the whole polygamy should be a biblical issue, not a Quranic issue. The four is not 300 or 1,000. I was waiting for our Christian friends to ask, when I asked them how many wives did uh, David have or, 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 or uh, or Solomon had, have, I was waiting for an answer so as to know that even in the, the pre-Islamic Arabia, when Islam came, it did its best in order to reduce and to limit the number to only four with certain conditions, as our brother there stated. Muslims now, even they would not even think of getting another wife because of some certain surrounding social circumstances that we know. But if there is a need, it becomes a must. Muslims have no widow clubs, they do not have single clubs, they do not have night clubs. And if it is not for the polygamy, you would have find many social troubles and problems. Polygamy is an intended as a solution to a social problem for a society that is losing its men in wars and in crisis and in catastrophe. And it will become a solution whenever there is a need. And there are many Muslim women who would like to share or to take their share as co-wives rather than to live as mistresses. It is more dignified. It is more acceptable. And it is respectable. So that is basically it. I don't want to be apologetic. But the Quran is intended to solve a problem, not to create it. And if the Muslims are not becoming part of the solution, they will become part of the problem themselves. That is basically it. Ten times better for a woman who will lose her husband in any way, leaving uh, behind him many kids, to be a co-wife in the Muslim world than to be without husband. And it becomes a, a must on the Muslim men to move, to take an action in order to adopt these kids and to shelter their sister and to take her in as a solution, not just as an entertainment. The problem is marriage is always seen and read in terms of sex. And this is why whenever someone will think about polygamy, it will be seen as something that will give men pleasure and joy in terms of sexual gratification. And through this, we have totally forgotten our social responsibility to take uh, these wives or these widows back as 
respected wife in the society because polygamy is intended to work in a society that is applying Islam in totality. And I cannot blame the West for that because we have failed to apply it in a way that will make sense to you. Yes. Can you take the mic? Yes, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Yes, the Prophet You are a Muslim, I assume. Are you a Muslim? Okay. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that means when it comes to predestination, we don't have anything to add. Even if it was predetermined and predestined long time ago before our birth, who knows it? And as long as we do not know it, we cannot claim it. This is simply, you cannot claim an unwritten law. If you will be caught by the police and he gave you a ticket, you cannot claim anything other than your legal right. Am I right? So how can you claim that God has created me and he has uh, predetermined long time before my birth that I will go to hellfire, so let me just enjoy this life. Yes. That he, he, you, may, you might have uh, legitimately and genuinely claim it if you know for sure that that is exactly what has been written and predestined for you. So the whole claim of predestination is theoretical only. In reality, no one knows. As long as God gave you the senses, and he gave you the ability and the power to do the right action, you will be responsible for our actions. And Allah says in the Quran, Inna hadaynahu sabila, imma shakiran wa imma kafura. That means we gave him the two ways, the way of salvation and the way of damnation. And with full right and choice, he had the ability to choose from among both. So there is freedom of choice, there is no doubt, but still, there is something divine that no one can know, and for sure there is no way that you can know, otherwise we'll be God ourselves, which is not the case. So we, do we have the right? Yes. Do we have a choice? Yes. We have the power to choose? Of course, yes. Otherwise, there is no sense of we be responsible for our actions. Go ahead, yes. Are you studying law? I, I see in you a potential of a lawyer. <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. That is not the hadith. The hadith is <laughs> she is asked if there are some who are predetermined to be damned and doomed and will stay like that. Then what is the sense in them being punished and be held responsible for their actions? The hadith is, إِنَّ أَحَدَكُمْ لَا يَعْمَلُ بِعَمَلِ أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ حَتَّى مَا يَبْقَى بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَهَا إِلَّا ذِرَاعَ فَيَسْبِقْ عَلَيْهِ الْكِتَابِ فَيَعْمَلْ بِعَمَلِ أَهْلِ النَّارِ فَيَدْخُلَهَا And the, the, the reverse is, uh, is, is true and correct. Uh, yes, there are some people who will work hard in order to be in heaven, saved and simply find their way to heaven. But due to what has been predestined long time ago, then they will have the, they will meet their destiny. That means they will change overnight and just few moments before their death and they will be in hellfire. So she's trying to quote the hadith in order to justify the claim that if I am predetermined to go to hell, then there is no way that I should be responsible for my actions. But the hadith was taken out of its context, and of course it has been misread and misinterpreted. The whole hadith, if we want to read it in order to make sense to us, is we cannot claim predetermination or predestination as a ground for us to go astray and to do whatever we like. Of course we, can do whatever we like. 
but we will end up disliking what we did. Yes. I'd just like to throw some light on what you already told to the sister. And um, I, you had a question like whether we are predetermined to be doomed or like go to hell or hell. Um, and I'd like to add in a way that I think most of the students or the common folk will understand. It's just like saying that there are like 50 students in a class and um, it's just like saying, oh, am I predetermined to fail or get an F grade or are like two students predetermined to get A plus and are whether some are students are predetermined to get B. Well, it's not like that. It's just like all the students in the class sit together and take down the notes and when the time of examination comes, you sit, study, prepare, and your results are based on how well you prepare, how well you do in your test and or in your exam. So accordingly, it's just the same way. Our life, we don't know whether it's predetermined or not, but we are, what we are supposed to do is to follow our duty and follow the book and um, do what we can do is be best according to the Quranic law or the will of Allah. And then it's up to him where we go. We don't know, nobody knows. Just like you you don't know whether you will get an A plus. Will you know, do you know that? Tomorrow, how many students in your class will get A plus? Do you know that? Nobody knows. It just depends how well we prepare ourselves. I hope that I've kind of clarified it a little bit. Um, that's fine. Uh, so there are some brothers who said this is not the issue, but let us just shed some light here. Uh, Sufism, um, the question is, uh, how do we, the Muslims who are the follower of the minhaj of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'a, see the Sufi mystics? Uh, are they uh, true Muslims or uh, what, how do we see them? The question is, from among the Sufi uh, mystics themselves, they are of different schools. Those who went f to the extreme right and those who went to the extreme left and in between, there are some Sufis like Imam Al-Junaid and Abdul Qadir Al-Jailani and whatever. If I can quote from Imam Al-Junaid, he said, إِنَّ طَرِيقَنَا مَرْسُومٌ بِشَرْعِ اللَّهِ فَمَنْ لَمْ يَحْفَظْ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ وَلَمْ يَعْلَمِ السُّنَّةِ فَلَيْسَ عَلَى طَرِيقِنَا وَمِنْهَاجِنَا If we will quote from Imam Al-Junaid, he said, our way is built on the foundations of the Quran and the Sunnah. And unless you would know the Quran, and you will understand the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you cannot claim that you are one of us. So for those who are extreme mystics, and who are simply believing in incarnation and in all these things like al-hulul, they are of course not Sufi followers according to Junaid himself, as the one of the founders of Sufism. I don't want uh, myself and any one of my brothers and sisters here to simply be judgmental, thinking that if uh, we will say a Sufi is in an nar we will go to Al-Jannah. No one will go to Al-Jannah simply because he will think that someone else is in nar. However, our yardstick that in order we are going to use and to apply for who is a Muslim and who is not is La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah and the preparedness in order to follow what you have said in actions by establishing the five daily prayers, giving the zakat and do the all of the five Islamic pillars. However, whatever is in the heart will always be a matter of God's will and is left to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to judge. That is what I can say about it. Any final question? Okay, um, like earlier you said, um, can you take the mic, please? Um, like earlier you said that um, the Western media, whatever, portray did um, injustice to Islam, Islamic people by showing like just Saddam Hussein 
people like that, but what about in the inner cities where um, you got a lot of Islam, Islamic people who set up their liquor stores on the black community, you know, in the black community, and you know, just, that, and that's why Farrakhan called them the blood suckers of the poor. What do you say to those people like that? Of course they are not representing Islam, and they are not spreading the call of Allah. And by their behavior, they are setting the worst example of, uh, of uh, Muslims. It is just like the blacks who enslaved the blacks in history. Do you agree? Black people enslaving black people, am I right? Here in this very country. So do you think that that is a disgrace to the black race? So likewise, Islam could not be presented by someone who is selling liquor in the black uh, corners of the city. So that is simple it. And you cannot judge Islam because there are few of these who are selling that or doing this. Islam could be only seen and read in the book of Allah and the sunnah of his prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and could not be taken from any action or word of anyone else. So this is what I have stated clearly at the beginning of my lecture. So if there are Arabs who are not doing uh, their job uh, right, we cannot condemn Islam. Or if there are some few brothers who are selling liquor, that does not mean that this is, uh, this is a, a defect in Islam itself. These are not good Muslims, period. Yes. Take the mic, please. Muslims believe that Islam is the religion of salvation. What do they think or do they have any views about other religions, the, the afterlife of other religions? And is there a difference between uh, Ahlul Kitab and other religions like Christians, Buddhists? قل يا أهل الكتاب تعالوا إلى كلمة سواء بيننا وبينكم أن لا نعبد إلا الله ولا نشرك به شيئا ولا يتخذ بعضنا بعضا أربابا من دون الله All the people of the book let us just come to one shared common ground a word of truth that we all should love, worship and follow one God and at the same time not to take men as gods and you know that whom we mean because we do believe that all the books that were given to the prophets, the center message or the central point is there is just one God and you have to follow his word. And don't take anyone as God. So Jesus Christ is a prophet. He did his best and he left. Moses, he did whatever he did by his homework and he left. And likewise, Muhammad. So if they are ready to believe in whatever we believe, there is one ground that we are standing on, and we will leave the other, the other part to Allah to judge over ourselves. قُلْ اللَّهُمَّ فَاطِرَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ عَالِمَ الْغَيْبِ وَالشَّهَادَةِ أَنْتَ تَحْكُمُ بَيْنَ عِبَادِكَ فِي مَا كَانُوا فِيهِ يَخْتَلِفُونَ Oh Allah, you know best, because you know the seen and the unseen, and on the day of judgment you are the only judge to judge over us. Period. I answered your question. We do not have any right to judge over any, but we have the right to call them to the right truth. And the plain truth is, as long as you are worshiping one God, and you believe in the message of truth, you will be saved. Otherwise, the whole thing is left into the hands of Allah. أنت تحكم بين عبادك فيما كانوا فيه يختلفون. Is that, is, is, is that what you understood from what I have said? Yes. That is your understanding. And you are entitled to it. Yes, just a minute, just a minute, yes. please. Yes. Who is Jesus Christ? I just want, uh, uh, I, 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 that's fine. I just want someone to tell me about Jesus Christ. I myself, I have been studying Christianity for two years, and I have never come across one definition about Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus? 
I just want, yeah, yes. If you can kindly stand up. No, 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 no. Uh, if you can, if. Okay. Okay, uh, let us just start afresh again. Who is Jesus Christ? Is he God? Is he son of God? Son of man? Or both? Is he three in one or one in three? What is the whole theory of Trinity stands on? The Quran is a direct refutation to this. There is just one God, and he is completely separate and different from anyone else, be Jesus Christ, Muhammad, Moses, or Aaron, or anyone else. And as long as you will come to believe in one God, the whole Christianity of today will simply come to ashes, because you believe that Jesus, he is God, son of God, son of man, and he will be sitting on the day of judgment to judge us, and he is the way through to the Father. Islam is a total refutation and rebuttal of this. And unless you would believe in this, in the way that we have stated it, you are not a Muslim. And this will set a clear demarcation between Islam and any other religion. As for the rest, that is only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because there are many people who may go astray simply because they have been misled, or they were not told the truth, or simply we did not do our best in order to call them to the cause of Allah. So simply to generalize and to say everyone will go to hellfire, that is not true. Because in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رَسُولًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not hold anyone responsible until and unless the message was made very clear to him through a responsible prophet or anyone of his followers. So in, 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 just to give you a final answer, this is it. Islam is the truth, and everyone else will be responsible as long as he has come to know the truth from the right source in the right way. Just a follow-up on the question right there in the back in terms of uh, Islam's thought on uh, Christian, Christians and Jews. Uh, what's uh, the perspective from, an, from Islam's perspective? Can we as Muslims say, if you're not a Muslim, then you would go to hell? From my understanding, it's not. What's your, what are your thoughts on that? My understanding is just like yours, sir. I share the same opinion. Thank God. Thank you. Yeah, One final question. Smile. Sorry. Smile. Uh, can you uh, please explain the notion of jihad and how it happens to be connected to terrorism? It was connected to terrorism for political uh, purposes. Mother, let me repeat the question. Yes. The question is uh, how jihad has been connected to terrorism. Yes, actually, jihad is from the Arabic word jahada. And jahada in Arabic, it means to struggle. And the first thing that you have to make, the first step that you have to take in the road of jihad is to struggle against yourself in order to bring peace to yourself. And then to struggle hard in order to let the word of God spread on earth. And it may take many forms, many shapes, and go through many stages. This is exactly it. But to only limit it to fighting a holy war using the sword to spread Islam, that is half truth. That is not the whole truth. This is why I said 
Neither we, the Muslims, are distorting Islam by not giving it in its total form, or others are distorting it by being so selective and taking Islam out of its context. Can we? Okay, we are coming. That's fine. But let us let us hear from the sister first. I, I believe in ladies first. <laughs> I just have a comment to make. I think in the beginning of the speech you said uh, we are here to understand and uh, learn. Um, I have I have a lot of. I'm not a Muslim. I'm not a Christian. And I have a lot of Muslim friends on campus, and I have been trying to understand this religion. But I do believe I have something to say to everybody that practices Islam. I think you should also open up and try to listen and understand to the other religions and other ways of people. Thank you very much. We promise, at least me, I will try always to open up and to understand others. Because without that, we cannot have a healthy interaction and coexistence. Actually, are just telling me to be a good Muslim by understanding others and cooperate with them. So thank you for reminding me that. And if it happens that you came across some of us who are not open-minded in the way you see, this is also might be true, but everyone is free to live his religion in any way he thinks fit. We do not have the right to impose our understanding on others or our standard on others by saying you have to be open-minded. It depends how you see it. For me, I said, otherwise I will be you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I said for me, I, don't, I didn't say for you. Can you comment on the history of the veil for women? And, and secondly, you asked the question, who is Jesus? You didn't get an answer from us. I didn't get an answer. Yeah, could you also answer that question? Who I don't, is Jesus? I don't have an answer. <laughs> I don't have an answer, and I don't want to go into the history of the veil. But of course, uh, for those who thought that uh, the veil is a pre-Islamic tradition, they always quote from a pre-Islamic poet. His name is An-Nabi Ghazubiani, in a very long uh, poem, which was highly celebrated by the uh, scholars of the Arabic studies. Uh, it says, سَقَطَ النَّصِيفُ وَلَمْ تُرِدْ إِسْقَاطَهُ فَتَنَاوَلَتْهُ وَاتَّقَتْنَا بِالْيَدِ And they said, the veil is a pre-Islamic tradition because this is a pre-Islamic uh, poet who was just mentioning in this poem that when the veil started to drop down uh, off her face, she just tried her best in order to cover her face up with her hand, with her arm. في قصيدته الطويلة في المتجرد زوجة النعمان بن المنذر أمن آل مية رائح أم مغتدي عجلان ذا زاد وغير مزود وزعم البوارح أن رحلتنا غدا وبذاك خبرنا الغداف الأسود سقط النصيف ولم ترد إسقاطه فتناولته واتقتنا باليد بذنب مخضب رحص كأن بنانه عنم يكاد من اللطافة يعقد the, 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 the relevant part of it is it shows that the veil is a pre-Islamic, existed since the uh, pre-Islamic era, but what Islam did is just it adopted it because it was part and it became part of it. Uh, whether it was pre-Islamic or, uh, or not, it is an Islamic part of the Islamic code of dress. Uh, it depends largely on where uh, and when it is started, and I, as I told you, the traditions, the customs played a major role in that. There are others who, depending on one of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad his name is Ibn Abbas, they say covering the face uh, is, uh, is not a requirement. And those who followed the fiqh of another companion, his name is Ibn Mas'ud, depending on certain interpretations of certain Quranic verses, they said it is a must 
to cover the whole body, which one is right or which is wrong, that no one can tell. And this is one of the things that I will just go tonight, leave it unsolved simply because I cannot solve it. Uh, any change cannot happen overnight. It takes really a uh, long time in order to become uh, reality. Whether that is uh, coming here in the United States or not, I do not know. Anyway, I have enjoyed this uh, session uh, so much. Thank you very much for being very attentive listener. And if it happens that in any way we have offended uh, your feelings, please accept my apology for that. Thank you very much.